I'm really excited now to start the next part of our conversation, which will now see us hearing from representatives from outside the university uh, in various industry sectors, working in, in a number of contexts to help us again to engage with these questions around data ethics, but now looking specifically at some of the experiences that they have as um, in, in, in their own uh, worlds. So the format will be that, that every speaker will uh, talk initially for 10 minutes, and then we have an opportunity for 10 minutes of conversation with the audience before moving to the next speaker. And then we have ample time after that to then have a, a much richer dialogue connecting on things that, that you're hearing uh, said uh, during the course of, of this panel. So to begin with, I'll, well, I'll introduce all the speakers and then we'll, then we'll start. So to my right is Abby Bloom. And Abby is a director board member of Sydney Water the Sydney Children's Hospital Network, and the State Insurance Regulatory Authority, uh, which also oversees Greenslip's workers' comp, home building insurance. And she's on the advisory boards of the New South Wales Aging Griffith University Enterprise and ID Exchange, a company that is helping people to protect and control the use and profit made from our personal information. She was a member of the board of the Privacy Foundation in early years and has expertise in both big data and qualitative methods. So that resonates really nicely with what we started to talk about in the morning. She's also an adjunct professor at Sydney University. Uh, it should be noted, so the remarks that she's going to make are reflecting the perspectives of a board director and also a consumer. To her right is Mike Briars, who is a UTS professor of the Internet of Things, a research facilitator and also the entrepreneur in residence. Uh, he has established the Knowledge Economy Institute at UTS, which is a hub that is designed directly to bring together industry, governments, and academia to harness the transformative power of digital technology and to solve contemporary challenges. And while he is sitting in UTS, because he has that industry focus, it's a really lovely connector then on this panel. Uh, he's also been designated as, the office, as an officer of the Order of Australia General Division in the Queen's Birthday Honours for 2016 uh, in um, regard for his distinguished service to the finance and digital technology sectors, particularly in the area of data-intensive research, analysis, and to higher education. To his right is Katie Payton, who is the Director of Technology Assurance and Governance and IT Program Director at ASIC. She's responsible for the delivery of technology projects, project methodologies, and IT corporate governance. She's a member of the ASIC Risk Committee and reports regularly to the ASIC Audit Committee. Her business career spans over 25 years in executive and management roles at Lendlease, IBM, and MLC. And she's speaking here from her perspective, working in the technology, in the IT um, area. To her right is Simon Pereira, who's the general manager at Datalicious Operations, where he's responsible for meeting the needs of a growing global client base, managing Datalicious's significant investment in product development, uh, including the SuperTag tag management platform and the Optima Hub media analytics platform. He joined Datalicious almost four years, uh, af after almost four years with marketing analytics from Avenzar and five years in senior radio sales roles. And finally, uh, Mike Willett is data analytics and information management professional with 20 years of experience both as a consultant and working with industry. He's held senior positions within EYC3, uh, which was previously known as EY or Ernst & Young, and Telstra, where the intelligent use of data was fundamental for his and for his team's success. He has a passion for understanding how new technologies can better support people in achieving their objectives and their engineering approaches that enable this to happen. So this is a fabulous panel to take us into the next round of our conversation. Uh, so uh, without it, any further introduction, I'll pass the floor now to Abby. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Just for those of you who wonder um, what it is that people who are on a board of directors do, the, the phrase to sit on a board of directors is often used. 
uh, it's as if we sit there and don't actually do any work um, and, and sort of march in once a month and sit for eight hours. Well, some of that is true. We do march in at least once a month, more often than not. And yes, we have very few breaks sitting there for eight hours. But if you think about more like what a drone does, and I'm talking about a fully equipped drone, our job is really to take a step above an organization and monitor not only what's happening immediately below us in the organization, but also what's happening in the ecosystem, our direct ecosystem, and the, and the broader landscape that might have an effect on our organization. And of course, it is our job to make sure that management who we hire, promote, or fire, um, are acting in the best interest of that organization, whether that is a, a social impact um, with, com with commercial uh, interests underlying or whether, whether it's profitability. So I'm going to be speaking from that perspective, but I'm also going to be speaking as a consumer because like every one of, of you here, I can't go an hour without disclosing some of my data, um, without entering some of my data to, um, to enter into some transaction. Um, and um, I also, as an individual who's been interested in privacy for a very long time, have an underlying concern about the use of data. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm going to refer very briefly to four different questions that occupy me as a board director and as a consumer. And I understand that it was a very, very fascinating morning. I was unable to attend, but I, I did get a, a briefing, and I think that um, what my comments are probably going to resonate with what you heard this morning. My first concern as a director is, are the businesses collecting the right information for genuine business purposes? My second concern are businesses or organizations, Sydney Water, Children's Hospital, adequately protecting the data that they have access to and the privacy of individuals who are contributing that data? Thinking about ethics, can we see a clear line of sight from the ethics and values articulated by that organization, their principles, the collection of data, then the use and protection of that data. So as a director, am I confident, or do I lie awake at night, that there is a clear connection amongst those? Are businesses unwittingly, deliberately, and possibly underhandedly using data and AI to discriminate in ways that are unlawful? Now, obviously, as I spoke with somebody uh, at, at coffee, the purpose of really good algorithms is to discriminate, to segment. But there are also things that businesses are not allowed to discriminate against. And are they doing that when they do it in ways that may technically not be illegal, but are nevertheless in some way damaging to society? Finally, what are the values, priorities, and motivations of the people who are controlling the process? And I think this is some of what you discussed this morning. The people who are deciding what data to collect and why they're collecting it, never mind what they're using it for, obviously writing the algorithms and controlling access to the data, and in many cases, selling the data in a variety of formats. I'm particularly concerned about the third parties to whom we all give access when we sign off on T's and C's. So it's not actually the organization that we think we're transacting with, it's some unidentified third party who are commonly engaged to do this work. What are their principles? And what do their ethics statements say? Do they even have principles and ethics? So I just want to, in the few minutes that we each have, I, I just wanted to give some remarks on each of those points. Um, first is whether or not businesses are collecting the right information for the genuine purposes. And here, um, as a director, 
I'm concerned that businesses are taking advantage of this revolution and collecting data that help business do its job better. Now, many of you sitting in New South Wales may know that there's been a huge push in the New South Wales government, in all government agencies, to use data to make the user experience easier, to, to also target issues arising, um, and in the case of uh, motor accidents and, and uh, insurance, to be more precise, to discriminate, so we can write more appropriate policies and the underlying uh, funds are available for them. So it's really, really important to know that the business is collecting the right data. Think about a children's hospital and the opportunity for engaging families and including children in their own care and doing so in such a way that children stay out of hospital rather than constantly having to come back to hospital. So the, the possibilities are enormous, but are we collecting the right data? Are we protecting the data and the privacy of individuals? Now this is a huge concern of me as a consumer, it's a huge concern of boards. Nobody wants to open up the paper in the morning and see that there's been a huge leak. But businesses and government organizations are being targeted with hacking attempts thousands of times a day. It, it is what you might suspect, but it's still genuinely scary. So boards of directors are hugely concerned with making sure that their organizations are adequately protecting the privacy of individuals. And as we're in an era now where we're transitioning from d notebooks, desktops, USBs, USBs are a real issue, to using, relying on the cloud, we still have a major risk in terms of USBs going AWOL. Right. Um, the third question was whether businesses are unwittingly, deliberately, or underhandedly using data and AI to discriminate. Um, I decided that I would be a ghost shopper, I would go on seek.com, and seek.com is not responsible for what happened, but I thought, let me, let me do what I know some, some of my colleagues have done, apply for a job on seek.com, find out what kind of data is being collected and what kind of explanations are being given. Um, and um, I did that, and I'm unable to show you the PowerPoints, which are pretty powerful, um, but it was very bizarre. There are three questions that I thought I should be able to give, I should be required to give aligned answers to. The title that I use, so I deliberately chose Mr. because I felt like it. Um, my <coughs> gender, um, and there was one, I think there's one other, one other title. Anyway, this, this organization, which I will not identify, is prominent in the lives of five and a half million people in Australia who are customers of this organization. And I put in male, and I put in, I put in Muse as my title. I put, in, I put in Muse. And then they asked my gender, and I had the most encyclopedic choice of gender I have ever seen. This organization is absolutely um, consistent with its diversity policy. I could have everything from prefer not to specify to gender fluid to you know, gender neutral to you name it. But the only other specific, specific information I was asked was my age. And they used, my, my colleagues will, will understand how mindless this is, they used ABS demographic five-year intervals under 20, uh, 21 to 25, 26 to 30, and, I'm, and I, I thought, how does this relate to this organization's principles and ethics? So I went back to it, and the only thing that they mention is that they are very, very, very big on diversity. They don't mention what kind of diversity, but very big in diversity. So it made me think, well, okay. So obviously they didn't ask me if I'm Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander in, uh, in my family background. They didn't ask me whether a, a language other than English was spoken at home. I thought that would be a real asset to be bilingual. Right? 
They actually didn't ask me my postcode, which I thought was interesting, so they weren't discriminating, discriminating on postcode. But they needed to know my age within five years and my, my gender choice. And, I, and I, I was left with the question, what are the, what are the values, priorities, and motivations of the people who are controlling this process? Does the, does the organization at the top, does the board of directors know what the employment experience is like? Oh, and by the way, this was supposedly a, um, a job which was client facing. So you're choosing somebody who has a lot of client contact, you're not hiring them in a back office. Anyway, um, I didn't actually complete, complete the application, just wanted to let you know that. Um, but it doesn't matter, you know, really which organization you, would, you, you check. You're disclosing a whole lot of data. You don't know where that data is going. And by the way, try to get the data back. So I deliberately ask organizations, can you please delete my data? No. <laughs> so I can opt in. I can opt out. But what opt out means is that I'm not hearing from them, but they've got all my data. Anyway, um, I want to leave it at that with those few remarks to give ample time to my colleagues and happy to um, have any questions or discussions later. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, so we do have some time for some immediate response, the way okay. we set that up so that we can build exactly on that example, if you like. I heard someone uh, remark in, in the audience. So are, are there some comments or questions, oh, questions. That, that someone would like to raise right now directly with Abby? Everyone's still picturing where they've, where they've applied for. Where yeah, is your data? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Where's your data? Oh, actually, the, the mics are over there, yeah. Sorry. Just if you can repeat the question. I'll just so repeat, everybody. sorry. Um, I was just wondering in that example you used whether the, there could be a possibility that the questions that were being asked were kind of asked because they're the sort of questions that have always been on forms for HR and so on, or whether the, whether the you know, whether it is in fact, you know, a deliberate attempt to try and, um, you know, provide some sort of categorization discrimination of, 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 of the people that are applying for, for those jobs? Look, I, um, I think every, everyone heard the question. I think it's a really good point. And for me, and again, it's just one example, but it, it does raise some important themes. One is, in the work that you do, you, you always want to ask, why are we continuing to do what we've always done the way we've always done it? Is it still robust? Is it still legitimate? So, you know, a classic example of that is, on the one hand, we have governments who really want people to keep working past the age of 65. Uh, but in this particular application, you could, you would have to lie if you were 66, because there wasn't any, you know, <laughs> anything like that on the scale. So, I think that's a clear, a clear example of, of just not not switching your brain on, not thinking, why are we doing this? I think in the case of the, uh, the, the gender questions, that was very contemporary. It was almost like, like someone passionately took a deep dive into that aspect of diversity. And that's wonderful. But it, for me, it didn't seem to reflect a broader commitment to diversity. And I was left wondering, are they deliberately trying to get diversity of age? Does this mean they're going to try to, you know? And I suspect not. I don't know. Um, were they deliberately going to use that gender? Inf and why? <laughs> why in the first stage of a job application? You know, before they even, you know, even ask, you know, to tick a box about cri meeting criteria, are they, are they asking this question? Yeah. There was a, a question in the back, yeah. I've got the mic over the back here, so. <laughs> oh, yeah. Hello. 
I just wanted to say um, two things about diversity in hiring algorithms and because on the one hand, sometimes you want to know someone's gender um, because you can often see patterns that are related to gender emerging in a data set even without having that information in it. So it helps you to identify where you might have patterns of bias. So sometimes I'm like, we, we want to include sensitive characteristics so that you can figure out where you might be, the data may actually be biased in other ways. But so I, what I have seen is now increasingly these kinds of characteristics being asked for specifically um, because of the way they change um, the decisions that you might make about a person. So recently I tested a product for an organisation who's very prominent in the tech space and they ask four questions of candidates. What is your age? What is your gender? How many credit cards do you have? And how many children do you have? And they are very open about the fact that they ask for that information because it helps them to understand your work-life balance, which to me can only be used to infer negative things about people's work-life balance, but they can't see that those kinds of inferences are damaging to some kinds of people more than others. They just see if you are a woman of a certain age, you are more likely to take time out of the workforce, and that is a valid inference for them to draw conclusions from. So I'm wondering how we yeah. bridge these two mm. challenges that on the one hand, sometimes a t an, an organization is being really responsible in collecting that information where they're trying to be bias free, but you know, in other ways it can emerge. But then there are also organizations where actually using it to perpetrate bias. Do you want me to answer? Look, I think you've hit on something really, really important, which is how do, how do we ensure that something that's, that's very common, even more common for millennials who change jobs every, what, 18 to 36 months, how can we, how can we ensure that that process um, is non-discriminatory in those areas which are, which are protected by law? And I would argue non-discriminatory in ways which may not be overtly protected by law but are morally, ethically the right thing to do. The next step is how do we make sure that what we sometimes call unconscious bias, in fact, is quite conscious. Because as some people I know who are in, in this field over the age of 50 have experienced, in many of these, you cannot proceed to the next question until you enter your date of birth or until you enter the year in which you received all of your credentials, including school leaving, which automatically, I, I see someone signaling to me in the front here, which automatically provides information that may or may not be used for illegal discrimination. My answer is leave it off, leave it off. Um, my question is, again, this is about ethics. So you look, you look at how you can stop your algorithm or, from um, discrimi discriminating illegally. So it's back to illegal. How much as a board looking at using ethics as a competitive advantage where actually by, you can actually um, use and identify each individual according to the age in this case, to actually promote diversity and actually strengthen your workforce? Or how, how is the board is looking at, is yeah. the board looking at ethics differently? That's my question. Look, th that, um, the question is how do, you, how do you use discriminating algorithms to produce an inclusive workforce? And I think that's, that's why I, I um, in my remarks, started in the beginning by talking about the need for organizations to, to have art articulated ethics, principles, and that extend through to the collection, use, and maintenance of data. And it is, it is actually, I think, part of the role of senior management and the board to make sure that unwittingly um, or uncontrollably data are not used for illegal or immoral purposes. So 
I, I was thinking about this a lot when I, I um, realized that there are a lot of third parties involved in this. And it's very rare that anyone knows who those third parties are or what, they act, what license they actually have to write and control and apply algorithms. So we all, and, I, and again, I, I was focusing specifically on recruitment because I don't have very much time today, so I just chose one example. And, you know, recruitment companies are using third parties and probably they need to, to do criminal checks, working with children checks, you know, things like that. But what are they doing in the background? What are their ethics and principles? And I just think that one of the reasons why we're all here today is because there, there is a, a really urgent need to shed some light on this whole process as we move more and more to a, a data-driven world. So we have time for maybe one more question directly with Abby before we move on. I was just going to follow up on, <laughs> sorry again, um, and I was thinking about that gender question and I can think of a very specific example which in our university here we ask that question because we're making decisions where we want to have a balanced um, slate of candidates for jobs in order to you know, increase diversity in particular yep. fields where women, yep. for example, haven't been able to achieve you know, similar, similar opportunities to men. So I think there are some cases where there are legitimate requirements to do that. Yes. But I love your idea that then says, you know, state that um, and talk about how you will collect, use and maintain that information in the future. And I think if you did that right, we can kind of resolve perhaps that, those challenges that, that are inherent in some of these, in some of these problems. Thank you. It, it's like being, being explicit and being consistent yeah. is that sense of And auditing right. yourself as yeah. well. Yeah. And you know, making sure you're actually doing yeah. what you say you're doing. Yeah. It's lovely. You. I mean, thank you very much right. for starting us off. Um, so now we'll move to Mike. Did you want to? Well, I okay. need to stand up. Okay. So. <laughs> Do you want me to bring something up for you oh, on the screen? I think about uh, that. Uh, yeah, no, yes. <laughs> Um, <coughs> so I've got a slightly easier topic. I get to talk about food. Um, so, um, so Teresa's asked me. To, I think it's a brand new area, uh, and uh, where data is becoming more and more important. I want to talk uh, through why that's the case and the sorts of things that are happening in the food industry, and how we're trying to um, work on uh, ways in which we can actually have uh, empower different actors in the system uh, to make good decisions about how they use data and when they use data. Um, but uh, by way of, uh, first of all, by way of advertising, uh, some of you would know me uh, as a, you know, it's like a many, many years in the, in, in, uh, in the data space, um, you know, reaching right back to the 90s uh, in financial markets when uh, even the term big data was not even used. And I've pretty much come across every single way you can misuse data or, um, uh, or use data to good advantage over this, uh, over this journey. Um, but uh, my new passion uh, since arriving here only n nearly two years ago uh, to UTS as a, uh, the, the first uh, entrepreneur in residence, um, to sort of bring some net networks together and emerge and understanding how uh, from my old big data days in digital uh, where we suddenly found that um, uh, not suddenly so much as uh, you know, a, a new sort of era of the Internet of Things emerged. And so a little bit of advertising. We do, UTS now, have uh, the peak body for Australia of the Internet of Things uh, Alliance uh, upstairs, about two floors up here. Uh, there are about 400 companies that are part of that alliance. They have various work streams, including a work stream on privacy, uh, data privacy and data security. Um, and we're looking to engage the academic community in some of those types of conversations right here on campus. You don't even have to leave campus to have those conversations. Second thing is that uh, we were successful, as some of you would know, in a bid for a CRC, uh, which we called Food Agility. It's also resident just two floors above us here. Um, UTS have kindly given us the space in the industry hub. Um, this is a quarter of a billion dollar uh, investment that we've raised from the commercial and public sector uh, uh, 
over the next 10 years. So we've got a big, we've got a long uh, road ahead of us, 10 years, but we reckon we can do some really fabulous things. But central, of course, is, uh, is, is this conversation around data. Because you know, part of the motivation here for the food industry is uh, that you know, with, by 2050, we have to almost double the production of food on this planet to feed everybody. On the other hand, we have a huge amount of food wastage at every part of the supply chain, and also that more people die from food-related illnesses than any other cause. So it's very impactful on people um, and so on, whether you're wasting it, whether you're eating the wrong stuff, or whether you're eating you know, unsafe food, or whether you're not eating at all, uh, is really important. And so digital uh, and data we believe is the is the is is the um, best opportunity that we have to actually solve some of these uh, problems. So I'm just going to try and handle this. Where is it? Looks like I'll have to use the mouse. There should be. In. Yeah. So just going to flick through these are little placeholder slides. I'm going to give you a bit of a background so you can ask me really really good questions in the next session. Um, so uh, it's about, we talk about the agri-food uh, system and the service and how we build services to support that system. And we also have a companion how we do this uh, by a, a term that we've been using is deliberate innovation. And I want to, that's the very human part of what we do. And I want to come to that. Uh, we've got a, like most companies, a vision of purpose. But really those, I wanted to highlight those words. Uh, this is about sustainability, safe and healthy, healthy food. And we believe that a lot of the, the things that we were doing will be supporting um, and identifying, authenticating nutritionally valuable food, um, to be able to feed information back to a grower or a food processor to improve the, the nutritional value of food, that, to improve the volume, quantity of, of, of food, but doing all that in a sustainable way by using less water, you know, less chemicals, uh, and looking after the land. Uh, all this is possible with the Internet of Things. Um, and this is just a little slide that I, I love to show because it's colourful. Uh, and really what this demonstrates, and you know, we can, we can crit criticise the metrics that uh, McKinsey uh, have used to construct this uh, graph, but really this uh, makes the point that uh, more often than not, agriculture is seen at the bottom of, our, of this uh, digital um, uh, matrix. So this is trying to measure digital readiness or digital maturity. And you see you know, the, the more mature sectors up the top there, you'll see financial, finance and insurance and so on. So from what we're trying to do as a, as a company now uh, is we're trying to move the agricultural sector up that, up that scale effectively. That's our, that's our mission over the next 10 years. But we've got to do it for good and not evil course. So some of the challenges uh, in the sector, uh, typically um, the technical issues really have been, whereas in factories and phones and social media and all the sorts of data that we've been talking about so far, it's more often not born digital. In the world of agriculture, you've got rural setting, you've got a rural environment, you've got weather conditions, you've got disease, you've got pests, you've got all sorts of things going on outside. And it turns out the things are harder to measure things get harder to measure. And that's despite there being data that's locked away that could be used, if only if we could work out how to do it. It's in tractors um, and all, uh, in, in, in different places. Um, and what, so effectively what we're trying to say, well, how do we, from a technical point of view, uh, catalyze and develop uh, trustworthy measurement systems in agriculture in particular. We cover the food value chain as I'll talk about in a moment, but I just want to talk about agriculture because that's particularly difficult. And what happens if we can actually help, have, if we become the advocates for sharing this data for, for greater impact? And I want to come back to that. And it's what we call data in circulation. It's really a key idea that we, we believe that as data circulates, in this sphere anyway, uh, we, increase, we, we can uh, increase the value uh, and we can also justify the investment in some under, underpinning infrastructure. Um, so when you when you see this, so you know, I keep, I've said this before, um, 
you know, the Internet of Things really renders the landscape as one giant, vast laboratory. And we believe, and as I'll come to in a moment, it's not just disrupting the food industry itself, but it's also disrupting policy and regulation. It's also disrupting science and research, as I'll come to. Pretty much everything, anything can be measured, uh, and we can see it in real time. And, uh, and more and more things are being measured every day, whether it's smell, uh, heat, acoustic sensors, or, or oral sensors, or temperature sensors, or moisture sensors, or wind direction sensors. They're all out there and available, and becoming more available and cheaper, and, uh, uh, and so on. So I want to just turn now to my oyster story. So uh, this is a really, um, it's all an illustration of some of the things that we're trying to do here. So here's an oyster grower, um, and uh, uh, and his environment now is totally saturated with measurement systems and tools. Uh, in this case, uh, the oyster grower has a problem, and that is that when there's, run, when there's rain, uh, runoff of rain, contaminants get into the water, oysters are filled with animals, uh, uh, they don't just not taste good, but they'll poison you if you eat those oysters. A few days later, when the water flushes through, the oyster is safe to eat. What the food safety regulator does is that they, based on, uh, on rainfall, uh, coarse rainfall, they say close your farm when, the water, uh, when, uh, when there's been so much rain. They literally, up until a year ago, gave the farmer a phone call and the far farmer had to put a red flag up on his shed and call all the boats in and say stop harvesting because the regulator said stop harvesting. And they're looking at the sky and they're saying there is... It's not raining here. Why is this happening? And so this, in this uh, system that's in place, and we're actually working with the New South Wales Food Safety Regulator at the moment on, our, on one of our, our projects, which UTS is involved in, um, in, uh, uh, in changing the regulation, the food safety regulation, by using data as an evidence base to correlate the biophysical characteristics of an oyster against the water that it's sitting in, in order to prove that that is a better proxy for closing oyster farms. Moreover, that data is being provided to researchers um, at this university uh, because that's solving one problem, the, oyster, the, the closure problem, the food safety problem, but we also want to be able to use that same data to predict disease because we know there's certain diseases that affect oysters and if we measure the, system, we measure the water that they're working in, we can also do that. We can give a farmer alert saying you've got a 60% probability of a, an outbreak of a particular disease because the temperature of the water has stayed this temperature for so long. So I want to take you upstream now. So I'm in the Coal River in Tassie. Uh, and uh, then now we've got to uh, Matt, um, Matt Pooley who's got a vineyard. And his vineyard sits on the river system that flows into this. Two minutes. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, and so, what I'm going to, what I would like to illustrate here is this: the connective, the connectedness, and what happens when you render things transparent. And so, I'm just going to skip since I've been given the hurry up. I'm going to skip quickly to just an example of um, where we're using this, where farmers, uh, where we've got a whole uh, sort of microclimate sensing and data systems embedded in farms to help them make decisions about when to harvest and so on. Uh, but at the same time, these, data, these farmers, these individual businesses are sharing their data and they've also got a common um, uh, system in the water, the irrigation, the water system, the river that runs between their farms. And what happens again in that situation, the regulator says, uh, when the water gets to an unhealthy level, the regulator says, cease to draw water from that system. Uh, in this situation, now the data has rendered the, uh, the health of the river system transparent to all the farmers. And we've had a situation where one of the farmers upstream have voluntarily unlo uh, uh, dumped water out of their dam into the river system to keep the water healthy for the rest of the system. So spontaneous cooperative behaviour in the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the interest of the whole ecosystem and so on. So I, I thought I'd love to give that example because it is an example of surprising 
the consequences of sharing data. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's not all, all bad. I'm just going to skip really, and the last thing I wanted to say uh, is what we, what we think, what, one of the solutions to this, some of these dilemmas is that we tend to look at individual and isolated problems. And what we're trying to do is say, well, what does the world look like if we invite all the players, all the actors in the system to help frame a problem and the solution, a co-design? So we've got a methodology which we've called deliberate innovation. It starts with design thinking, but it says, says well, okay, we've just done one in the wine industry where we've got you know, some, wine, uh, some wine grape growers, We've got a regulator, we've got a technology uh, partner, we've got a bank. Um, and you'll see, you know, this is just a sketch of some of the players that would, you would normally see in this thing. So what does that do? That means that we've, got a dis we've automatically built into the design of the project an awareness and appreciation of what data can do, what can it do for uh, me. But importantly, it puts a grower, somebody who you're taking data from, uh, in the same room as a banker who they might otherwise be afraid of giving data to because they'll screw them in some way, or an insurer, or something like that. Um, so uh, we're trying to take the nervousness out of, I guess, sharing data for good benefit um, uh, by, by designing our, our uh, projects in this, this sort of way. So I think this is really uh, sort of uh, key uh, to, to what we're doing. It's a little bit easier, not too much personal data here, uh, but, you know, it's obviously, uh, so it's a little bit easier from a sharing point of view. But it sort of starts to get to the point where, you know, where we see automated systems, um, much like we saw in the, in, the, um, in the financial markets, going from algos, uh, developing algorithms from data and having those computers generated uh, trading in the market. And we all saw what happened there. Um, right through to, well, what happens now if you've got a robot sitting on the end of a data system that's been instructed to do something, prune, uh, pick, uh, water, do something, and that's slightly out of tune, obviously uh, that could be devastating as well. So um, the, this, the agricultural system is relatively immature, but it's a really hotbed for uh, new ideas and new thinking and getting it right uh, from, from the outset. And uh, I'd like to uh, put a call out for anybody, any particularly you know, the data, data community at UTS and, and, uh, and particularly around the, the ethics of what we're doing because we do want to use us, ourselves as a showcase for how you, how you try and do it properly. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Cheers. So we have some time for some direct questions to follow on from the examples that Mike just gave in the food industry. Uh, if there's, yes. You had that last graph with the ecosystem and you had the producer and yeah. the wholesaler and the supply, um, mm -hmm. consumer. Do you see blockchain technology helping that in terms of like Woolworths and Coles at the moment have mm -hmm. a horrible monopoly over producers causing yeah. problems? Um, do you think that your system will alleviate the producer's yeah, no, I problems? Think that's, that's, that's one of the emerging, we've, we've got a blockchain program. Uh, mm -hmm. We've just, in, in Brisbane uh, yesterday, uh, on Monday, ran a blockchain workshop for beef, the beef industry. Um, and yeah, so it holds up that possibility that you can have trusted from a provenance point of view, because you know, we've know like there's food, a lot of food fraud, this was supposedly in China, you know, there's 40 times the amount of grain hermitage sold than is made. Uh, um, and so how do you put, how do you attach a digital story, authenticating story to a food product as it goes through? Um, and uh, so, so from a, both from a, so blockchain, both from a, a provenance perspective, what we would call provenance or food safety, um, but in, in terms of actually the credentials of this food that you're eating does have this nutritional profile uh, versus, um, uh, versus the payment system that has to go alongside that. So I would say, uh, looking at my financial markets colleagues over there, uh, that you know, the, the purchasing, the, the transaction flow uh, is relatively mature, but the underpinning technology to render something trustworthy uh, is still emergent in the food industry because that's what the blockchain relies on. Because at the end of the day, if I'm taking something from you as a grower and I'm a processor, how do I know, you know, how do I authenticate what you've given me? Is it, is it organic, you know, is it grass-fed, you know, 
what credentials is the thing you're giving me? So how do you, how do you demonstrate that to me? And more and more it's becoming digital. And whether it's an invisible tattoo or whether it's some other type of a tag or, or image or something that flows through, through the process. Jack's getting his exercise running around. I've been very involved in some of this um, in trying to change farming practices and it seems to me this invisible thing I'd just like to pick up a bit more mm. because um, with most of the food being grown in remote areas in Australia mm. and most of the politics occurring in cities where everyone lives and eats yeah. it, it seems to me that the invisibility of pollution, and in my lifetime the IPA has certainly stopped monitoring pollution in Sydney rather a lot, and in the water system. Um, it, it seems to me, you know, that we really have to think about how, who need, you know, it's one thing to talk about the business transactions hmm. and verifying food for sale for the important people in the city, hmm. but actually the people in the city, I think, need to understand pollution patterns and what's yeah. happening to the waterways in ways that would make what's happened in the Murray-Darling Basin at the moment absolutely impossible in the mm. face of the science and mm. the monitoring. You know, it shouldn't just be possible for that to get to that state mm. Mm. with its impact yeah, on the food surprising. production. Yeah, look, I, I've just been surprised. I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a student, I, think I call myself a student of uh, food and agriculture. I've been this in, probably embedded six years now. Um, but um, I've learned uh, so much. Uh, but I've also learned a lot about uh, uh, agriculture and farming and their values. And I've also learned, if you take that system's perspective, that a bank, that there, you know, we, we can do all the best regulation and policy and worry about what farmers are doing out there in the bush and destroying things and stuff like that. We can worry about all that like. Mm. But the system is actually moving them to be more honest. <laughs> And, you know, in a sense of, um, you know, as a bank, so we're, we're, NAB is one of our major uh, cornerstone partners. They've got a program which they call natural capital uh, uh, accounting, which is really putting a value on land. So they, so there's uh, practices as say, for example, farmer can use, they can, they can put a lot of nitrogen on their crop and get a really good yield this year and justify the loan or the capital, the investment from the, the bank. Uh, but in the meantime, nitri too much nitrogen in the soil kills a microbe in the soil that actually produces soil. Uh, and so, you know, so now there's a, you know, so there's a heightened awareness of this. And so the type of technology, whether you've got a chemical sensor or all these types of technologies now can measure the health of the landscape. And to the extent that, you know, a bank's, you know, you know at some point a bank or an insurer, same thing, uh, who are really trying to measure un uncertainty, they were trying to reduce uncertainty. There's a big incentive for them because at the moment they put a big risk premium on these things because far agriculture is complex, it's weather dependent, it's disease, it's pests, all these things going on here. Uncertainty, put a big fat margin on it. So, but if I'm an innovative farmer and I'm optimise, I'm using technologies to optimise my water use, which is a big cost, uh, to society and the farmer, by the way, um, that I'm uh, that I've actually uh, got. I can prove that I've put a, an adequate part of my uh, farm away for diversity. Um, and by the way, I can now get ca carbon credits for it, so I'm further incentivised to to grow that diversity. Um, and these types of attributes. So so effectively, then um, I can attract a better loan, a cheaper loan. I can attract more investment if I'm able to. Dem much like we would demonstrate to a health company uh, that we're healthy because we're go going to the gym, we're doing mitigating things, we've got a healthy lifestyle, so we, we reduce our insurance, the same sort of idea. If a farmer can demonstrate that they have healthy, healthy practice, they have methods and processes to ensure that they sustain that healthy, uh, he healthy environment, they get rewarded for it by the capitalist system. So, yeah. yeah. Am 
might, I might just yeah. say at that point, we'll just we'll, it, hold, hold those thoughts. I have post-it notes that I should have distributed. If you want to hold on something for us to bring into the wider conversation, just in the interest of time, I'm going to move on to Katie. But thank you very much Please. for opening that up. Um, And it, and it does raise that question about data as evidence in those cases. So, but as I said, we've, we've designed this so that we've got a lot of time just before we have our own food to start talking about these things as well. So now, thanks, Katie. Teresa. Thank you. Okay, is that mic on? Yep. Thanks. Yep. Thanks, everybody. Um, I just wanted to give you a quick overview from the regulator's perspective. So I work at ASIC. Um, I've worked in projects for a number of years there where we're delivering to government legislation. So as the government legislates and things go through the parliament, through the Senate, we then build the IT systems to regulate the market. So whether it's crowdsource equity funding, data analytics projects to take big data, Morningstar, ASX, et cetera, into some sort of an environment where we can then do some analytics and you know, look for the outliers. So we're using a lot of data analytics at the moment um, and we're also starting to, to move into the space of AI. So we're looking at opportunities to use this um, machine learning on evidence. As we take data from companies and we look for misconduct or anomalies in the market, we're, we're putting these um, algorithms over the data and we're, we're training the algorithms to look for particular pieces of evidence. And so over time, a proof of concept we've just done has shown that the machine learning is actually coming back with much better results than we could do manually through, I mean, you can imagine with case law and, and evidence collection. So at the law firms, I'm sure some of you are in this space, are moving very much towards this space. And, um, and I think the government is, is moving towards you know, accepting that as, as an option. So um, as we do this, we're looking at predictive coding, um, technology, assisted reviews, those sorts of things. And we're looking for these, um, I guess, these flags. Now, I guess as we move into that space, there, there comes the benefits. We can look for things like um, are people unlicensed and offering financial advice, for example? Um, are there you know, situations where we might not necessarily find people if we use our manual in our old approaches? So this really helps. Um, but if I bring it back to a more personal perspective, there is an opportunity and there's also a risk. So we're looking at the governance of this environment. As we move into the AI world and the big data world, how are we going to govern this? Both internally as an organisation, just as ASIC is any other organisation, but then also for the markets to ensure you know, fair and equitable markets, but without stifling innovation. And I guess that's the key. I mean, as we've said quite a bit today, we all give up our personal data every day. It gives us a convenience. We're willing to do it, and it's fairly benign. You know, I don't know about you guys, but I don't put my birth, birth date in Facebook. Well, not the right one. Uh, I'll be 21 forever. It's great. Um, but uh, you know, we, we take precautions, um, and we're willing to, to let our tracker tell you know Google where we are because we like having Google Maps know exactly when we're looking for a map where we are and where we're getting to. So there's a convenience factor there, but sometimes there's an unease with that as well. So when you go into, say, Google and your, um, as happened to me, your 11-year-old goes onto the home computer and sees um, through the Google ads some sort of predictive um, enticement sort of ads coming up and, and decides that, hmm, maybe she can predict what, your, what her birthday present is that you just bought for her. <laughs> so um, these unintended consequences of us giving up our data and then allowing that data to then be used back to us um, in these predictive and um, in ways that we don't necessarily want. How do we opt in? How do we opt out? Can we even opt out? Um, I was quite horrified the other day when I got an email from someone, it was free text, and the Gmail suggested the response. It was unbelievable. And it was an invitation. So it was free text. It wasn't like a pre-formatted thing. And it was an invitation to something. And it said to me, do you want to respond to this or this? And I was like, what? <laughs> That's too much. It's read the content of that note. And look, obviously, we all know that, that this can be done. But it took it to, into that realm of, mm, this is really starting to feel uncomfortable. Um, I haven't seen that happen again. 
Um, so I'm not sure if maybe there was some feedback on that particular feature and they took it away very quickly. Um, but as we move into the realms of big data and AI, the examples become less and less benign. So as we were just talking about, if your insurance company can, you know, application can talk to, say, your, um, you know, Apple, whatever, that tells you how many steps you've done for the day and can hook in with, say, your shopping list and somehow make some connections that say, I'm not going to let you order, um, you know, all your junk food on, <laughs> on your weekly shopping list anymore because you haven't done your steps and the insurance company said no. I mean, you know, this is, we're not in the realms of impossibility here. Um, is this going to affect our credit ratings? So what decisions are we going to allow these um, applications to make? Um, so just talking from a personal perspective, I think there are a lot of opportunities, but then I think as consumers, and this is back to Teresa's point right at the very beginning, we need to be mobilised as, as a collective group to say what do we actually want out of this and, and make sure that we have a voice because large corporations, profit driven, um, everyone has an incentive in a particular area, what do we as a consumer want to do? Um, okay, so I'm going to move really quickly through a few things. Um, the level of transparency. What's our recourse when the data is incorrect? Big data, making decisions about us, our credit ratings, what have you. If I was to say, well, I've got all this data in my back pocket about me that you don't have, I want that to be considered because I want my credit rating to be improved. How do we as, as consumers have that ability to recourse and to question what is the data that's being used, how is the al algorithm being written and what biases are in the system. Um, I think that uh, yeah, from a regulator's perspective, we're not even close to that. But as consumers, we need to be really thinking about that and pushing for decisions in those organisations. And I really firmly believe that the ethics within an organisation will come first. The regulation, the compliance, those things will follow. The organisations that have the ethics built in that's probably a market leading opportunity. Um, there are a couple of examples. Um, there's an application called, um, uh, what's it called, I've forgotten. Anyway, I'll tell you in a minute. Um, Therese, I think it's called, that has um, a messaging app with encryption and even the provider can't actually get to those messages. Now that could be you know, quite a, um, a differentiator in the market. There's a search engine called Private Me that protects people's privacy. So that would stop the 11-year-old situation that we just spoke about with the birthday present. Um, people, I think consumers, as these applications and systems start to become more invasive, will start to look for these other options and, and that's where the difference will come. Um, so yeah, unintended consequences. The other thing I just wanted to mention was diversity of design. So if we don't have diverse teams, diverse thinking, we're going to have these biases in our algorithms, we're going to have data, that is unintendedly moving us towards decisions without artificial intelligence. And as these algorithms learn, how do we then get visibility to why and how they're making these decisions? So we always need to be able to understand how and why. And once we lose sight of that, um, I think we're, we're moving into territory that is becoming very dangerous. Um, oh, look, I had some um, you know, fantastic examples, um, melanoma scans. You know, there's no way I would want a doctor to manually scan, you know, look at my scan and tell me whether I had a, uh, you know, a melanoma. The apps, the, the AI systems can do it some x-fold better than a human can already. So in those situations, fantastic, you know, bring it on. In other situations, maybe we just need to be a little bit more um, responsible. And then I wonder also whether these systems are making us smarter, like with the melanoma scan, or making us dumber. <laughs> because um, you know, my uncle went to hospital from the country and he was moved from one emergency room to another, you know, almost on death's door, and they didn't take his paperwork with him and they wanted to get in touch with his wife. And funny enough, um, the guy from Cowra, who was in the room just down the hallway, the nurse said, you don't happen to know this guy. And he said, I do actually. You wouldn't know his phone number, would you? Yeah. It, it's blah, 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 blah. Now, that's a generational thing. I mean, I couldn't tell you phone numbers for anyone beyond my husband and my three kids, really. Maybe my mum. Um, everyone else that's in that phone, and if I lost the phone, you know, I have no way of connecting with them. So, 
are we becoming smarter? Yes, in some areas, but then also are we becoming dumber and more dependent? You know, do we need Google to tell us what we're going to buy for a birthday present or that it's sunny outside so put on sunscreen or, yeah. or you know, <laughs> um, or the car to be um, restricted so that it can't speed? You know, at what point do we become a nanny state? Um, but then how much do we actually need for our common good? Um, and then I guess the other point would be around um, at what point are these decisions that we're programming into these algorithms um, making technical decisions versus moral decisions. So, for example, you know, we all talk about autonomous vehicles and, you know, the autonomous vehicle can choose this lane or that lane, this lane, they're going to kill 10 people and that way they're going to kill 50 and, but, you know, these are young and these are old or, you know, these sort of, you know, <laughs> um, or, or does it just, you know, self-combust and, 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 and self-destruct? So, at some point, there will come decisions that are being made by people in this room data scientists, um, algorithmic developers, design teams, and they are moral decisions. So we're, how do we build ethics into what we're doing? And I guess that was the, one of the things I wanted to end with is, as a university, as educators, this is really um, exciting that these conversations are happening at UTS and that the um, transdisciplinary area has been set up because we need more than just technical people. We need people who can think more broadly. And we need diverse teams so we can get away from those biases. Um, and we need to keep promoting these conversations in the general public so we build the awareness. We get away from the fear-mongering and the Hollywood dystopian, you know, robots are going to take over because it's probably not that far. We're not there. <laughs> but then we're probably also not quite too far on the other side either. Somewhere in the middle there we need to be very careful with what we've got and use it for good. And I think I will wrap Thank it up you. there. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Again, we, we have some time for some directed questions um, immediately in response to uh, the thought starters that Katie's put out there. If anyone would like to pick up on, on something there. Simon. Thank you, Katie. Um, can you say anything about where things have got to in ASIC about the question of algorithmic accountability, transparency. How, how are people thinking about how those questions should be asked and what kinds of answers should be given? Yeah. Um, look, I work in the IT department at ASIC, so I am not actually a regulator. I'm not setting policy. I'm not you know, working with government on policy setting. I implement the IT systems that then regulate the market. But from what I can see, I don't think anyone really has the answers on this. You know, do we end up with AI monitoring AI? Because we can't, because as humans, we can't keep up with where this technology is going. I don't know. From a personal perspective, I think at this point, all we can do is say, build, design, test, build governance into the way we're building our systems. So, you know, the, the methodologies around these systems can't be to release beta systems anymore. Um, I mean, obviously, NASA is not not releasing beta systems, but with these sorts of applications that are at the consumer level at the moment, it's okay to go out with something that's sort of half-baked and then your consumer's feedback and you sort of fix it as you go. As we move more and more into AI, I don't think that's actually so much of a possibility because you're playing at a very large scale with people's lives. No longer is the decision of, am I going to cancel that passport, an individual sitting in a department it's actually a, a robotic algorithm that's doing it at a scale unknown to, you know, I can't even comprehend. And, and the impact could be, in some cases, life-threatening or life-changing. So um, I'm not really answering your question except to say that I think this is going to be really hard. Mm. Um, but have diversity of thought, have really good methodologies around what you're releasing, and then monitor it as you go. So don't, don't just set and forget because these things are changing. As the data sets change, the algorithm's learning, this is going to be changing on a daily basis. The outcomes need to be monitored to make sure that we're not building in um, unconscious decisions. Do you want to say something? Right? I was going to just add, just the, having worked in the sector, yeah, yeah. on insider trading and all sorts mm. of things, and, and watching you know, just how, how fast things can happen. And you, know, you look at 
you know, even on, in trading rooms and, and, and so on, how you've, I think over the time I was there, it went from a second to a, is it, I forget which one's smaller, is it a millisecond, a nanosecond, and, yeah. you know, and these timestamps. Uh, yeah. And so then, and then we've got you know, these algorithms yeah. that are trading effectively and yeah. they can spill, you know, if something goes wrong, some things spill out of, you know, millions of billions of dollars just get wiped out in seconds, you know. So it's, um, mm. it's right, it's, I think financial markets are really at the critical end of that, mm. you know, where mm. things happen so fast yeah. mm. and where we'll discover, um, um, you know, where some of those challenges are. And I think there will need to be regulation around mm. what you are allowed to automate. Mm. I think there will come a point where we say, actually, we're not going to let that go that far. Mm. You know, this sort of mm. real-time trading mm. and having apps talking, you know, like applications talking to each other, making decisions could get... Um, into a space that we don't necessarily want to go to. If, if I can just contribute an example that really is life and death from, from health and, and medical, um, there is always a high risk of human error in what they call medication management. Mm -hmm. So the, for, the formulation and the dispensing or the, the, the administration of, of medication in healthcare settings. Um, and that's where um, you actually are you're actually doubling down. You're not just mm. pressing go and letting it happen. You actually have to have um, the, the same question asked a number of different times before you act, because it, it can really be life and death. Mm. And it, it is also an area where um, the digitalization can contribute enormously. Because right. um, people get tired, they work long shifts, or people don't have the right glasses prescription they should have, or so forth, things that are unwitting um, that um, actually digitalization can help. Yeah. Katie, just following on from Simon's question to you, which I really appreciate your response about the complexity of some of the algorithms and so on. Um, you know, we sort of see today where companies perhaps deliberately um, obfuscate things. I was just reading an article before where a judge here in um, Australia is is getting quite frustrated at Volkswagen for not providing information as to how the algorithms worked that um, dealt with their um, engine performance and so on. I wonder whether we will, will make that problem significantly worse when the algorithms are driven by AI, machine learning, trained on data sets as you spoke about before, where it actually becomes almost infeasible in some cases to actually explain why and a decision has been made. Yeah. You know, surely from a mm. corporate governance and mm. a board perspective mm. and a regulatory perspective, mm. this takes us into pretty challenging territory. Yeah. You know, in the case I talked about before, the judge is going to, you know, drag presumably some Volkswagen executives kicking and screaming yeah. to explain why these algorithms were mm. done, but possibly in the future, it will be very hard, if not impossible, to the answer. Transparency, I think. Transparency yeah. right now, we can, we can lobby for. Yeah. But over time, as these algorithms are learning, yeah. that's the whole point of, mm -hmm. of the machine learning. We're going to start to lose that transparency. Mm -hmm. um, Duke yes, University, I'm oh, sorry, um, Duke University um, had a, a trial on a judiciary system, uh, a criminal justice. Um, I think it was around uh, jailing people, sentencing. It was a sentencing application. And they took the stand that they weren't going to get it right first time. So they said, we're going to publish open source all of our code and all of our data sets. And we're going to let people run tests through it so we can gather more and more data. And then we can get a really broad cross section of society and try to take the bias out of the systems. Because using existing data, you're just proliferating mm -hmm. existing biases. Um, back to the job ad. A friend of mine uh, was looking at some statistics and women were getting more jobs fed to them that were of lower pay than men because, now who knows why exactly, but probably because there was a bias in the algorithm but also because the data was based on today's data. And what is today is not what we necessarily want for tomorrow, but it was then sort of futuristically um, transposing the bias of today and making it self-fulfilling for tomorrow. Mm. Um, so we need to look at all those things. Yeah, that's, really that's the I whole predictive I challenge. Yeah. 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 I just no, wanted to... Yeah. Sorry. Oh, just, uh, just a reflection. It was like, you know, that whole, you know, where we 
talk a lot about transparency and how it, you know um, it's a real a catalyst for innovation often. Um, but then how you lose what you've just made me think mm -hmm. about is how you lose that as you lose as things become all more automated mm -hmm. and more algorithmic, mm -hmm. you lose that transparency and mm -hmm. it starts to look more like a black box. Yeah, yeah. And this is where the tier two yeah. AI starts yeah. to come yeah. in, and then it's that just absolutely. starts to blow your mind. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just just two, two quick observations. Um, Katie, I think that you've just uh, put out a number of really important challenges to the audience, mm. Um, mm. especially those of you who are, are in industry, and especially, but particularly those of you who are thinking of doing a, a postgraduate thesis or project. Um, that yeah. Be, yeah. There are some really important challenges yeah. there. Yeah. Um, and, and I did want to say one other thing, which is, again, wearing my consumer's hat, can you imagine me ringing up a call center and asking, could you please explain to me how this algorithm ended up deciding that, mm. you know, my travel insurance is mm. going to double this year as opposed to, la to mm. last, mm. last year? Mm. I mean, so, so the, the question here is, what about the poor consumer? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, and how you does know, that have What hope do we like? have? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I um, am sometimes disruptive, and um, when one of my medical practitioners, uh, their office wanted to photograph me, they wanted to have, to have a facial image of me, um, and I just asked, why? What do you mean, why? I said, I said well, <laughs> why? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, and never mind, you know, what level of security do you have in your system, but why? Um, and there was some, some lame, lame excuse, but that was a face-to-face -face interaction, and I got poor service ever after, mm. having asked that, that mm. question. <laughs> but imagine when you're at the, at the end of a, of a phone, yeah. talking to a call center somewhere, and the poor person, they're never going to yeah. have it. Yeah. Yeah. So, we, you know, yeah. so what's the recourse going to be? A, mm. Another challenge. Mm. We, we talked about that in the break. I mean, that challenge, how often when you're asked for that information, you're asked by someone who has no authority to, to decide the year or nay, hasn't most likely been given the explanation as to where this started. It probably is historically something that they used to ask for that they forgot that they don't need anymore. Mm -hmm. And you just want a service. Mm -hmm. And this poor person is like, okay, what, mm -hmm. what do I do here? But it does lead to, to really bad experiences and it also perpetuates some of those problematic mm -hmm. collection. Um, well, and at least it'll say who owns your data, because yeah. Yeah. if your data is being used to make a lot of decisions that really impact your life, yeah. you know, how do you then get access to it when companies, they say they own it, right? Yeah. And so who owns yeah. the data? How do you get access yeah. to it? How do you fix yeah. it when it's broken, when it's stuck in a blockchain that's, yeah. you know, <laughs> so And, then, and how do you code that, which is what we've talked. So we'll take one more question from the audience before we move on to Simon. Sorry. Because I actually, saw someone waving their hand. It's yeah. actually um, just on the point about the explanation. Peter Norvi was in Australia mm -hmm. and did a bit of a talk about what Google was working at. And his explanation was humans, when they actually tell you the reason why they do something, um, they actually don't give you the right reason. They just give you a reason. So mm. his view was that if the AI or the algorithm was doing the same, that would be fine enough. So. Mm. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He would say that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, and I get that, you know, people aren't always honest, so you can ask an organisation why they decided to, you know, not give you the job or whatever it was, and they're going to tell you something that's not necessarily mm. honest. Mm. So there's no difference there too. But, but the organisation still knows that they're not being honest and they know really why they did it. Um, so yeah, it's just a bit different when the decisions, you know, your passport's been cancelled, yeah. Um, but nobody knows why. <laughs> Where is it? Yeah. yeah. Well, that's opened up. Again, lovely conversations to connect with at the end of, of the rest of our panel presentation. So, Simon, this is a, a, an opportunity to, to hear from your perspective in marketing. We've just been talking about... Um, yeah, very different. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what's exciting. The richness of this panel is to, yeah. is to look at a range of perspectives and then have time for us as a community to then um, look at some of the similarities, the differences, and, and really move into that question of, well, what, what can we do individually and collectively? So. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, so today I wanted to address the issue of choice, um, specifically within marketing, um, which is an area where AI is being heavily invested in, and not just by individual companies, but some of the larger organisations as well. Most of you would have heard of 
you know, things like Google Brain and IBM Watson and, and these guys are trying to democratise um, AI for, for, for marketers. So um, quite an interesting area. I should first state, first state that I am, however, not a data scientist or a data engineer or a web analyst or a programmer of any kind. Um, I am, in fact, just a lonely sales and marketing guy. I spent the last 20 years of my life in sales, marketing and operations. Um, and I know that's how some people in this room look at sales and marketing guys when we're sitting at computers. So um, please bear with me. Um, I have, however, spent the better part of 15 years trying to convince um, advertisers, marketers, and even media agencies to start using data to optimise uh, the way they're marketing to consumers, to improve the way uh, consumers engage with them as a business, and to improve the experience that we have with brands. Um, I can tell you there's plenty of blood on that wall. Um, and that comes from a journey from traditional media uh, migrating from a single you know, radio into, into um, multiple digital outdoor uh, and TV formats uh, and then moving across from, from, from media into media technology and trying to um, work with analytics and now finally into uh, big data and media attribution analytics space. Um, along the way, there are still many challenges. And uh, what I find interesting here is we're talking about things um, and they're, they're amazing and they're scary, but there's still a long way to go to get there. But I think this is the right time to start talking about it because there are a lot of big challenges to discuss. So the idea um, of having AI democratise, democratise uh, data insights uh, and actually provide, and when I say democratise, I don't just mean having a whole room full of data scientists and engineers coming up with, with our rooms. I'm actually talking about getting away from the SQL and the, and the R Python and, the, and, the, and, and um, the programming side of it and looking at plain text, simple language applications. So as a marketer or as a business owner, I can jump on an interface ask a question of my marketing or ask a question of my consumer and get valuable insights and straight away actually have at hand actionable insights that I can take and use in market. And for me that, that sounds pretty good because if, if that means that I don't have to see another ad for a TV show I'll never watch or for clothes I will never wear because clearly I can't pull off those haircuts. <laughs> and who wears socks with underwear anyway? Um, or be advertising, or, or, or see advertising that I don't need yet, yet. Um, then that sort of, it, it does make me excited. Uh, and I think it's a, it's, I think it's a good thing. We are time poor. So if we can optimize that process, if we can improve that journey, then that is benefiting us. And really, this in, in the marketing space, that's what it is about. It's connecting all these millions and millions of touch points um, that currently is a huge um, man, man hour, woman hour work with data scientists pulling in information from multiple data um, sources, uh, trying to stitch them together, trying to create a story. Um, and, and, and that's a really expensive process, which is why I said that at the moment it's, it's not actually happening as fast as you would think. Most companies are still trying to piece these things together, let alone start leveraging it. But it is happening. And the idea is that um, my journey is, is mapped from start to finish. And as, as I go along that journey, each step has been tailored for me. So my, from my very first visit to the website or into a store to my, um, uh, my confirmation of, of, of reviews on, on YouTube or uh, asking questions to Google or starting to get reviews on my phone, that, that the company follows me through that journey and provides me the information when I need it. And if they can actually predict when I'm going to need it, that's even better. Because if I've started looking for an anniversary present for my, for, for my wedding, for example, um, and then I've subsequently forgot about it, which I have, 
Uh, and then Google can remind me that I was looking at something for Friday, this Friday, which I've forgotten, <laughs> then that's a good thing. That, that helps me. And in doing so, what they're doing is they start creating this personal, this, uh, personal persona or this online persona of me. Um, now, whether we want to talk about it as being um, identifiable or anonymous, anonymous is another issue. Um, and certainly, we've already raised some of those issues. Uh, and it's going to get even more complicated next year. The GDPR, uh, which kicks in, I think, May of 2018, uh, for us in particular in the marketing space, we have always dealt with cookies as non-PII information. Uh, as of next year within Europe, pretty much any piece of data will be counted as PII. If I attach an IP address to a cookie, then that's pretty much done it. That's, that's enough to count it as PII. Um, so that's, uh, that's, that's probably another issue. But as, as they start identifying this, um, and they really, uh, they, they, this, is where, this is where the issue starts coming. So they build this persona about who I am. Uh, but, and this is, my, this is my personal mantra, so, so life is a consequence of choice, right? So every day we get up, we make choices from the moment we step out of bed to the moment we go to bed. And those choices have consequences. Those consequences ultimately determine what happened to me and how my day went, my week went, my month went, my year went. And what happens when uh, companies start really targeting to that persona that they've got of me is they actually start restricting my visibility because they're only showing me brands they think I'm interested in. They're only showing me brands or they're giving me news articles or they're giving me updates on things that have been in the past. They are based on actions that I have previously taken and that they're forecasting it uh, forward. And by doing that, they're actually taking that choice, my choice as a human, away from me. Because what if I want to make a stupid decision and actually watch Housewives of New Jersey? Um, what if uh, I actually want to go to McDonald's for the first time in months and, and pig out on a cheeseburger? By continually focusing on my past behaviour and restricting what I can see. And it, that's, that's not too hard to do because, you know, I, I, I cruise most of my internet usages on my phone, um, which means it's pretty easy to follow me around. They can pretty much uh, determine where I've been, what I'm doing. So it's, it's not hard to really tailor everything that I'm seeing to, to past behaviour. So if I am effectively uh, my past choices, if, if, if who I am as, as, as a person is what I've chosen, then if companies have the ability to restrict what, I, what I'm seeing and what I engage with, then they potentially have an influence over who I am. And I don't think it's actually too far, far a stretch. For example, if you subscribe to a particular news channel, and that news channel has categorised you as, something, as someone interested into a particular type of content, then it's in their best interest to serve you that content so that you engage with that page, because your engagement is, with that page is what is driving the advertising dollars on that website. But if that means that I miss news on other things that are outside of my normal day-to-day -day, um, interactions, then I'm actually becoming a less diverse person. I'm actually becoming a more strictly defined person. Now, this isn't necessarily all that new. The concept of cradle to grave advertising has been around for a long time. And marketers have tried to control or engage with people from the moment that you know, they, can, they can watch TV or read a magazine or, or live, live outside to the moment die for a long time. And you don't have to go too far back um, to have a look at uh, an example where the, the question of ethics in, in that environment actually came up. If you have a look at McDonald's not too long ago, 
which are one of the traditional sort of cradle to grave advertisers, there was a big question about whether or not the message that McDonald's had created for a generation of people around their food actually being a healthy, uh, a healthy um, diet for long term came into question. And look, McDonald's reacted very well to it. Their marketing, the way that they dealt with it was fantastic. They put health food in the junk food store and everybody sort of figured the problem had gone away. But the reality is you go to McDonald's to eat junk food. You don't go to McDonald's for a chicken salad. But that's OK. So that, again, McDonald's did it well. But it, it is a question of you know, if someone's telling you a story long enough and you start believing it, you've got to understand what are the motives and the morals behind or the ethics behind that story. And I think it's important to note that you know, these aren't, this isn't our parents restricting what we see on TV or telling us, you know, or showing which, which allowing us to which, watch which news um, we're allowed to watch and, and control because they're trying to help us grow into to, to people, uh, to good people. These are not non-profit organisations that are working for the betterment of, of, of the human race. These are corporations. And corporations ultimately have agendas. Um, and I, look, I'm a capitalist. I understand we, we have to make money. That's what we're here for. Um, but ultimately, whether I'm an ethical business or not, I do have an underlying agenda to, to deliver revenue and money into the business to my shareholders, to my owners. And while that is the case, then there is always, question, there is always a question as to my motives about the information I provide you as an individual. So I think it's, um, it's a really interesting, an interesting, uh, interesting topic of where, where is that fine line between improving my user experience and providing me a more convenient uh, and, and efficient process to actually manipulating who I am going to be in three or four months' time because you've restricted the choices I have and, and, the, and the access to information that I have. So I think we, uh, I think, yeah, I think we really have to be conscious about um, who it is that's controlling uh, the, 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 the brands we're seeing, the news we're seeing, the information that we're seeing, and how do we control that and how do we have some sort of say over um, expanding that horizon. And that's it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm struck, I mean, I don't know why it never occurred to me before, but some of the questions you, ju you just put there about that tension between efficiency and discovery are exactly the issues that have come up in information systems and information retrieval. So yeah. there are times where you want, yeah. you don't want to have to think, you want to be able to see that you've got the, the right set of information, but other times you need to be able to explore and to diverge. Mm. Uh, yeah. How we become educated to know what we think might be our best um, way of doing that, but how a company might be able to help is another challenge too. Yeah, there's, there's a great example recently of a, a code that was leaked um, uh, to access the entire back catalogue for Netflix. Mm -hmm. Because Netflix obviously are one of those organisations that are taking a profile and streamlining what they show you based on your past preferences. So what you, when you jump on Netflix and you have a look at your profile, what you're seeing is only a fraction of the back catalogue that they have. Um, but that's being based on your preferences. Mm -hmm. But just because I, I, I may have consumed a lot of action-adventure movies, it doesn't mean that on a, you know, on a Friday night after a long week at work, I don't want to watch a rom-com. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, so you, you, I think you have, to, you have to take that into account as to... You know, just because I, my behaviour is this, I, I am human and I'm not irrational. I, sorry, I'm not rational. I'm not, I, I'm not always logical. I, I, I actually want the right to be emotional or irrational. Yeah. I want to make stupid decisions. And, and it, you know, that's how we grow and learn. Or different decisions. So, you know, my past behaviour does not predict everything that I could or will do. Yeah. So, there was a good example of that. I think it was Spotify. And look, I might have this slightly wrong, but um, where people were complaining that it continued to just show them music that was aligned to what they'd already been watching or listening to. Mm. And they weren't getting any breadth or diversity. And I think Spotify then started throwing in a few random, you know, <laughs> genres and things to try and, you know, just sort of break that a little bit because because we do we become sort of myopic and, and yeah. we just reinforce our biases mm. and 
mm. that's not necessarily a good thing for society. Yeah. No, I don't, I, I don't yeah. think well, for the human that's, experience. Yeah. So. That's, I, I, thought, I found it really, uh, really, that was really cool. Uh, mm. I thought um, you were applying from a marketing and advertising perspective, but in all areas that mm. restricts. Mm. So imagine a new world where there's new policy and regulation being implemented and it happens in a second. They just turn mm. on a device that mm. says now you can only use, uh, yeah, you know, this is a 60 kilometre speed limit, not a 20, and everything's monitoring it. Um, and the decision made. Yeah. That's right. And so you've, you've been, uh, whether it's law and policy, or whether it's, um, you know, in the, in our industry, food and so on, what you can eat and so on. Um, the more and more the technology is evolving, that actually will monitor that and reduce your choices yeah. over time. By the way, junk food uh, kills more people uh, than famines and wars. Mm. Stay out of the McDonald's, mate. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah, just and, and I think that uh, that issue of things changing as well without you having control over it. So the new iOS 11 um, mm -hmm. software update mm -hmm. that uh, has been big topic within a big topic within our industry, which effectively restricts third-party cookies from existing for more than uh, 24 hours on on iOS devices. Mm -hmm. um, that decision was made by Apple. It was released and then the rest of the market had to deal with the consequence mm. of that. So taking, again, taking a consumer perspective from it, I actually might want my mm. cookie to persist mm. because, again, it actually helps improve my consumer journey mm. Mm. with a particular brand. Mm. Um, but I haven't been given a choice over mm. that at all. I've mm. just been for something. Mm. Now, Apple will come out and say it's for security reasons, it's, it's for, for privacy good. reasons, it's <laughs> for my own good, but I reserve the right to decide what is yeah. Yeah. my own good. Yeah. And that, that's yeah. a market power, isn't it? Like, I mean, that's yeah. almost into the misuse of market power space that the ACCC is yeah. starting to look at. Yeah. 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 Kindly yes. explain that I will be back. You'll be back. Yes. Yes. And, yeah. So was this a good time then? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so, so um, Ab I'm just going to explain, so we'll give a round of applause to Abby, not because the panel is closing, but Ab Abby <laughs> wears so many hats, she has to dash off, she will be back for our closing next steps conversation at four o'clock, but please take a moment with me to thank Abby. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And if anyone can explain to me why I keep almost every day getting advertisements for fertility programs. <laughs> I'm, talking, I'm talking about, I, I really don't want to have any more children. Who else is using your device? What is the machine thinking there? Hmm. So, so we might um, use it as a transition then to Mike. For my talk, I'm going to draw my experience at EY. So for those of you that don't know, EY, it's a consultancy business. So this is going to be a consultant's perspective. But I've also worked in Telstra uh, as an industry person as well. Uh, in that area, I was working in fraud prevention, so very much heavy reliance on data to find the, um, the bad behaviours, I guess, that uh, affect Telstra at a corporate level anyway. And I'm going to not so much take the consumer view, but more the organisational view. I can't be as specific as perhaps some of the earlier speakers are, but I'll maybe try and talk about some of the general trends or observations that I'm making uh, with a number of the clients that I work with. And look, I particularly focus on government and public sector, uh, but also uh, energy sector as well as one that I spend a lot of time in. So the first thing I would say is it's very rare for me to have a discussion about data ethics uh, with any engagement with uh, any of my clients. Uh, unless there's a primary research component to that, uh, no one really says, I want to talk about ethics and what we're doing and why we're doing it and how we're going to go about it, at least not at that uh, particular level. It's fair to say some of the adjacencies of ethics do get discussed and do get dis discussed quite intensively, so privacy uh, gets a lot of attention, security of information, uh, confidentiality, so we... Uh, it's pretty Abby's not here. We as a third party, you know, we're often recipients of other organisations' data and therefore they want to know and understand the protections that we will afford uh, to them for that. And, you know, there is the Commonwealth Privacy Act which uh, sits over the top of us. So we do have obligations as well as our own values uh, in terms of how we look to treat that data. But ethics itself is, is rarely discussed. If there's a piece of work that uh, we're engaged with around integrating data between two different organisations, uh, particularly if that's at a unit level, and I say unit, obviously I'm thinking person, but other uh, individual levels rather than aggregation level, then there can be some discussion. There will be discussion around consent uh, and has the data that's been provided, was it collected for the purpose with which we are now intending to use it for? So, you know, 
we collected this for A, we want to use it for B. There's a lot of discussion around how we understand and determine whether consent is required to be explicitly captured or perhaps can be implicitly uh, implied. And there is a lot of review of, of privacy legislation when we look at that, particularly if it's government, you know, you're looking at the state and territory legislation and when it's private sector, it's, you're directed towards the Commonwealth. And there are differences, subtle differences sometimes that we need to make sure um, we're aware of. Uh, and in those uh, discussions, it's probably also worth making sure this is not a one-size-fits-all kind of discussion where we sort of talk about everything and it's a standard discussion. The level and degree of prescription that we will go to around the purpose really depends on what the particular client wants to talk to and talk about. So some clients will be happy that we have a broad guiding principles around how we're going to use the data. Other clients will want to be highly prescriptive to the, to the extent of almost specifying the queries that we executed against the data, seeing the wireframes of how this data will be presented before actually running the data in anger. And I say that because uh, there's a big boundary or a big, um, a big spectrum in terms of the discussions that we have, which drive sort of the behavior and the response and the ethical considerations maybe around what we're gonna do with the data. However, if we're too prescriptive, I would argue, with uh, the purpose for the data and the data that we're going to use, then we, we may well miss out on some of the insight. And if we don't have uh, the opportunity to explore the data, test it out, thrash it around a little bit, beat it up in a number of different ways, then it's unlikely that the insights uh, that we're hoping for may yet be yielded by that particular data. If somebody knew the answer already, uh, they would find that in the data already. By putting the data together and having that opportunity to explore, it, it affords more opportunities to find the insights that perhaps people are not uh, necessarily aware of today. And when you find the insights, you can change your policy directions or you can change how you deliver services uh, to citizens and residents. So I'll just break away a little bit from that sort of thread and talk about uh, what it's like in some of the data teams in organisations today, whether they're centralised data team, uh, so a COE which sort of services a whole organisation, or decentralised, sitting out in functional areas, uh, and just give you a flavour for the challenges that those individuals and teams face, the responses that they're making to those challenges that are being put upon them, because I think if you think about the responses, then you can start thinking about the ethical decisions they need to be making and be aware of. And I won't pretend to have all of the answers, but I'll um, maybe raise a few questions for you to ponder on. So in terms of the challenges, beyond the three Vs of data that Gartner, uh, big data that Gartner put out, that's a technical kind of area and issue, and that one's uh, not necessarily as critical for this discussion. First challenge is there's a, a huge pace of innovation in the analytics and data market at the moment. Uh, we're talking about AI and the emergence of AI, but there's new tools, new applications, new algorithms released on a regular basis. And that's a sign, a classic sign, of a market very early on the adoption curve in terms of its maturity. Uh, when you see fast-paced innovation, you know you haven't quite captured the full market, and there's a huge space for this to grow and change. And so timing of events like this uh, is opportune. Because even though big data is a word, if you like, it's been around for 10 years, it's still very early days in its um, real adoption. Second thing is there's very high expectations placed on data teams and organisations. Um, we've all heard the, the sell words or the snake oil associated with data. A lot of executives, uh, secretaries, uh, etc., in organisations are thinking that data is going to be the saviour for them. Uh, so that puts a lot of pressure on these data people to find the insights, to drive the action, to drive the improved performance, whatever the objectives may be. There's a deep misunderstanding really of the methods uh, around which insight can be generated as well in a number of these uh, organisations. So I think many people think uh, it, doing analytics is like doing a Google search where I can expect an answer in sub-second and I'll get the best answer up the top. It's not the, it's certainly not the today's reality of trying to crunch data uh, and get some outcomes. There's a further misunderstanding of the value that data can provide as well. So, uh, you know, I think um, if I get the insight, I'll get the result, I'll get to achieve my measures. But that's not the way it occurs. And perhaps big data has probably suffered from not being able to clearly articulate what its benefits can be. And so therefore we articulate what the benefits can be by telling use cases and telling stories about where we can do different things, which is different to the previous technological revolutions 
uh, that we've seen. So uh, if I think back, and I am a little bit older than many of you, uh, ERPs, when they came in, everybody had an intu intuitive, intu intuitive understanding that ERPs will manage your processes. We understood that when CRMs come in, they will manage our customers. When we put e-commerce platforms in, we'll manage our payment processes. And we put big data in, and we don't know, well, what do we get? We, uh, we, we're not quite sure. So we don't have that same level of intuition uh, in the organisation. And beside that, decision makers want to consume the data very easily and very quickly. So we're dealing with a largely uh, non-technical audience who's trying to understand a technical output and expecting the data teams to do that. So I give that background as some of the, the squeeze, if you like, that is applied to these data teams um, as they grapple with trying to you know, deliver value to their organisation and, like anything, um, support their existence and support the continued investment, potentially, in data in these organisations. So how do they respond to this? And again, yeah, these are generalisms rather than necessarily any uh, specific point. So how do we respond to businesses, business users who don't understand exactly what they're doing and where they want to go and what they want to achieve? Well, we respond with Agile. Uh, and if you're not familiar with Agile methods, as opposed to waterfall, it's a very iterative process. Uh, it's rapidly iterated, get minimal viable products out there, deliver it to the business, get the feedback in and change, and just continually, you know, new, new test, test, test and learn, change, test and learn, change, and a continual cycle, you know, which can vary from one to six weeks of new testing uh, and learning things. How do we respond, how do data teams respond to the demand from their organisations to go and put things in code into production um, at rapid pace too? So, you know, it's one thing, and data probably two or three years ago had this, it's one thing to find an insight, it's a totally separate thing to put that into production, into, embed it into a business process, embed it into an application, embed it wherever it needs to go. So, I always say it's very easy, well, easy, relatively easy to develop a one-off piece of analytics that will give you some insight. It's infinitely more complex to embed that within the organisation. So we respond as, as data people, we, we adopt DevOps principles, uh, again, to make it uh, easier to containerize or productionize our code, bundle it up and deploy things, you know, every two or three days from a technical point of view. So now we can iterate quickly, we can put code into production in two or three days, every two or three days. So if you come from the old world, you know, you're talking three month cycles before you get anything new. It gives you a whole opportunity to test and see does it work, does it not work, etc. The new world will be, it's two to three days max between, can be between idea and it being tested in the market, whatever the market is. So this raises, and I think the fellow speakers have touched on some of this already, you know, how are we going to get control, how are we going to get exposure, how are we going to understand this? Um, if we're putting new releases and new algorithms into the market every two or three days and potentially changing the recommendations that we make, the regulations that we monitor, the food that we check, how are we going to control and keep an eye on that? I don't have an answer uh, for that one. The drive for insights requires integration of, of, of data. If it was all in a single data set and you could do a pivot table on a spreadsheet, then you wouldn't need any of the big data technologies uh, and the like that we talk about. So with insights from joining data up, how do we understand the context in which the data is being collected? So there's a whole raft of data governance uh, frameworks, processes, procedures and policies that organisations look to put in place to control and manage what they do with their data so it's used or understood for what it particularly is. Because there's plenty of misinterpretation of raw data leading to the wrong conclusion uh, being drawn. And if we're building, and we've talked, some of the speakers talked about this already, if we're building this uh, ubiquitous record of all of the information we have about a particular entity, single view of customer as uh, probably the primary case, you know, how much do we really want to collect on our customer's behaviour? You know, how many data points do we really want to have? How scary do we really want to be in terms of what we know um, about particular individuals? And so I, I think some of the responses, and this probably comes, I've used the recruitment example before as well, you start to see organisations separating data from decision uh, a little bit as well. So uh, you can collect the data. So let me, I would say, I would, if a client asks me about the, and I'll use it very specific case, the should I ask the gender question on an application for a job, my recommendation would be, yes, you probably should think about collecting that, but that doesn't mean you forward it through to that particular decision, that recruitment decision. So you can 
if you like, cut that information out to pass it on being removed because that's one decision that you're making with that data. But there may be other decisions that require uh, that particular piece of data to be valuable. Some of them we've talked about already through the course, but in a piece of work that I can, well, not the client, but I can talk about is one of our clients was concerned that the way that they word particular jobs and particular position descriptions lends themselves to having uh, more male applicants than female applicants, even though the role in itself had no inherent need to have any gender split. So if we don't capture information on who's applying for the jobs, we can't see whether or not those jobs have this unconscious bias in it, and therefore we can't go and make change and amendments, even in just, forget the, uh, whether you get the job, forget about even reviewing the ad and thinking about applying for the job in the first place, because it's just worded, it doesn't appeal to a certain, um, in that case, a certain demographic, but there could be all sorts of other biases that reside in there. Uh, algorithms as well, so all the other speakers have touched on, these algorithms are getting smarter, they are getting more democratised, they are being more accessible, you don't need to be a PhD, sorry if there's any PhDs in the room, you don't have to be a PhD in statistics anymore to be able to run advanced AI uh, from Google, albeit two years or three years behind what Google's probably really working on. Uh, you can access these things relatively easier and it will only get easier uh, as well. And I also can, I agree with the point around you learn from the past. Um, and so a lot of these algorithms are reinforcing the past. Though I do note that they, um, they do try and throw furfies in as part of the algorithm process as well. So I do get ads for cat food, which I don't respond to because I don't have a cat. So now they know that I don't have a cat as well. So they're also learning my dispreferences by testing uh, little things like that um, as well. Uh, so that will raise ethical issues, which we've touched on already. And then the communication back to business users, and I'm going to... This is a big topic in its own right around visualisation and presentment of information back to decision makers. Uh, we all know that you can lie with a chart or present the particular story that you'd like to as you change colour, shape, position, etc. Uh, for me, there's a whole swag of ethical issues around how we present the insights that we've got back um, to allow for the right decision to be made. So lastly, I just probably want to touch on what is perhaps today in my view anyway, one of the biggest challenges for data teams, and that's the, the human element uh, of analytics. Uh, there's often significant cultural disconnect between the technology uh, and the organisation, and that certainly impacts success. Uh, however, again, however success is defined. Um, so my passion is really around connecting technology and people, and there is no easy way or no real easy answers for that at the moment. And as we think about data, and I said I'm going to take the organisational view, it's really going to change fundamentally the way people work today. Um, so I know I've talked about the consumer, but the way people work will change as well. And this is more than just the displacement of jobs uh, through autonomous vehicles. Yes, that is certainly something that we need to think about and address. But we're going to move from, a, I used to get my report every week, now I can look at it in real time. We're going to move to an organisation or organisations where because data is so available throughout the organisation and democratised throughout the organisation, decision making is now democratised through the organisation. And what does that mean to our traditional hierarchies of decision where information used to flow top down? Okay, now almost everybody can have access to any other data. And we're also going to change our role. So, uh, you know, in the, and this is a bit more in the future, today you have managers who manage people who manage tasks. I say that at a very high level. Now, already with the algorithms, we're going to have managers who manage algorithms who manage tasks. So we have a whole different kind of structure around what we're looking after and what we're doing. Uh, we're managing data, we're managing algorithms, we're not necessarily directly connected with people. So my team of the future might not be a team of people, it might be a team of algorithms that I have to look after and optimise. Uh, and I say that, as I said, the nature of work will change, and I think this discussion, this forum, to consider some of those impacts uh, is what it's all about. And I'm looking forward to this as we go through the rest of the day to see if any of those things get teased down and resolved. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. You've actually taken on the added role of trying to wrap up everything that's been said to this point to now um, take the last minutes before lunch as an opportunity for for more conversation to be thrown at us. And again, to take this on for thinking and bringing back into that closing next steps conversation. So, thank you. 
I can't help myself but ask questions, so my apologies. Um, Mike, I was interested in the fact that you said that the... Sorry, Mike. There's two mics, but... Yeah. There's two mics. The mic at the end, Mike it from Ernst & Young. Um, that there's... That word ethics of data is not necessarily used inside the space in which you're working, yet when I listen to you, you're almost you know, beautifully describing many of the questions that we need to do. Yeah. So do you think we need to do something differently um, or you know, is that term, is the approach we're taking correct? You know, the idea that you'll be managing a team of algorithms, I think, is just a beautiful image. Yeah. And then, you know, had it back to all of the sort of things we were talking about before. So, you know, do you, do you see, even if it's not called ethics of data inside business yet, that this is going to be, this whole space is going to be critically important for us in the future? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think Abby probably touched on it coming from a board uh, point of view. Um, you know, organisations already have a whole suite of risk management functions and activities. Uh, you know, we, we manage privacy, they manage compliance, they manage legal risk, etc. depending on their particular organisation. I would like to see uh, organisations, you know, adding how they manage data through its whole life cycle um, as a top level risk, particularly if it's so critical to their business, which it is to almost all businesses today. So it's not, I don't think it's there yet, apart from a privacy and security kind of issue treated, but the, the use of it is probably something that has to be elevated. And maybe this is what the four o'clock discussion is meant to tease out further, but, but yes. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great primer for that. Thank you. Thank you for your series of wonderful talks. And this, I guess, is a question for Mike and Simon, but perhaps the whole panel. There seems to be a, bit, a thread around these uh, perpetuating norms that we may or may not want to continue um, with these various algorithms. And that's sort of the human state. Sometimes we learn from our past, but sometimes we continue to repeat the past. And working in climate change, that's something that, rather than using climate change projections, we're still often using hindcasts, which don't often uh, give us the information that we will come into reality. What is, we have all this digital information, but how does AI necessarily work alongside with this embodied knowledge that we carry around with us all the time? Uh, and in regards to the food, uh, CRC, uh, I'm actually doing a project between our farmers and bankers, and there is a lot of embodied knowledge that farmers have that that isn't digitised, nor do they want it to be. Mm -hmm. And so do we want, in, the, in this discussion around uh, digitisations and humans <laughs> and ethics, where is that line between extracting information from humans and keeping it to manage choice, allowing people to be people and you know, make mistakes and but also having those wonderful, happy accidents that leads to the next wonderful, beautiful thing. Yeah. Uh, I, think, uh, I think replicating human behaviour is really hard. I think mm. trying to isolate what it is that drives us to grow and drives us to, to, to develop ourselves is, is something that's still not yet developed. I think what we need to talk about is using AI for what AI is really good for, right? And, and using humans for what humans are good for. And, and humans are good for creating inspiration. Humans are, are great at, at um, seeing things that don't, shouldn't exist, shouldn't be there. And I think, you know, you talk to farmers and, I, and I've, I've, I've grown, up, grown up around rural environments all my life and, and you can tell me with 100% accuracy what, whether it's going to rain or not today, but then the farmer can probably tell you that whether it rains or not today is irrelevant because tomorrow the cows are going to sit down and ruin the grass. Yeah. I don't know. Like, mm -hmm. There's just certain elements that you have to, have to accept that AI will get us to, to, to this point and then what humans are great at, there's always going to be a role for that. Yeah. Um, and it's just, I think it varies as to how big a role humans play mm. versus how big a role yeah. AI so It's sort of a really interesting uh, how you put that question, actually. Because um, on one thing, I, was, I wanted to jump in and say, because one of the things I've been sort of, I guess, evangelising is, you know, farmers are the ultimate entrepreneurs. They make more decisions in a day than most of us make in a month or two uh, because of the complexity mm. of just managing the environment. 
But the other thing, you know, I pick up there is, uh, and I, you know, it's empathy. <laughs> you know, humans, we, we've yet to, you know, you know there's, there's some human qualities that we all have uh, that will, uh, ability to be able to empathise and be able to put yourself in somebody else's uh, shoes. Uh, and I think also, um, you know, that, that creative element to actually define a problem, you know. Um, you know, there's, you know, machines will solve problems, but you've got to sort of work out what the problem is that you want to solve. Mm -hmm. So there's always a role for humans to be able to mm -hmm. do that as well. And I think that's really important. That's why I feel very passionate about the whole, you know, how we have to be, you know, this multi, you know, whether you call it transdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, mm -hmm. but we have to have a broader systems perspective on things and you know, understanding. Mm -hmm. Because more and more, a little thing I do over here is going to impact something yeah. over there really yeah. quickly. And it's not going to take a year to do that. It might take a second to do that. Mm -hmm. And so more and more it requires that um, I mean, maybe AI will eventually do that, you know, some <laughs> offer in the future, but at least on, uh, most people are believing that that's where we are at the moment. It, it, it's a lovely question because it flags one of the points we try to make in MDSI and what I try to do in my research, which is that not all data is digital. So that, that idea of embodied knowledge that sits in the head of a farmer or someone who just has that gut instinct, that is a form of data. It just is less easy for us to ourselves understand and extract it, let alone get an AI mm. working on it. And it's not an either or, it is again, it's that big and. But, uh, and I was struck by it when you were talking about the example of the cat um, ad that comes to you and you don't answer. So I immediately think, is it because there's no cat or because you're not interested in cat merchandise through that vehicle? And how do we then stop ourselves from saying, okay, just because I haven't selected this or, or just because I have doesn't mean I have a cat. It might be that I liked the picture or I'm into cat memes. And yeah. you know, that's so, so, so there's, there's all those, those interesting assumptions that we very naturally make because we are in a very digitized space yeah. and because AI works very well in that. But um, someone flagged in, in the hypothetical activity earlier, there's a lot we don't know about the human genome. And the human genome is an extraordinary data set that if we could crack that, that would just be amazing. Um, but then the question is, if we've cracked it, have we cracked it, or are there things that we haven't yet discovered? And that's, again, where the past is not everything that we, we can know. Uh, and again, it doesn't stop us from moving forward, but having those little voices that go, okay, what other data can I bring into there? Yeah, I think um, in, in preparation for this, I was thinking about failure because, you know, failure is quite often... Um, mm used as the greatest example of why humans have succeeded, mm. right? Because mm. we, we, if, you, if, you know, if you were the Wright brothers and after your, your third crash, you know, you turn around, you, you, Wilbur turns around to us and I said, well, you know, bugger this whole <laughs> crashing thing, um, let's just stick to bicycles, <laughs> which is probably what a machine would have said. I mean, mm. a machine would have said, you know, you've tried this, based on the information, the data we have, it's not possible to do what you're trying to do, stop. Mm. And yet, what, what, what is required is you need that, that craziness that, 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 that drives and inspires humans to say, oh, I don't care whether I've crashed three, four, or five times. Yeah. I'm going to try another 10 times before I succeed. And, and that, I think, is really important, is that that's the, that's the human element. So running the data on whether something was good or bad is, mm. is great. Let, let a machine do that. That's what it's good at doing. It's mm. far better than humans at doing it. But making a call off the back of that data is still yeah. a human's place to say, don't care what the data says, I'm going to try again anyway. Yeah, I confirm that too. I mean, um, maybe 20, 30 years ago, the best chess player was a human being. Maybe 10, 15 years ago, the best chess player in the world was a computer. Now, neither of them can beat a man and machine combination. Yeah. So yeah. It's, and I think that's probably what, the, for me, as a... Simple analogy, what I, the future looks like. Great one of my favourite examples, most recent examples, uh, uh, at, the Australian, at the Australian Wine Research Institute uh, down in Adelaide, and uh, we're doing a tour of the labs, and they do uh, chemical analysis and all sorts. They've got this $10 million piece of equipment. It's like huge, it's computer, it's the latest thing from Germany. It does everything, and it's got buttons and flashing lights and... And, uh, and this is so it's m about sort of measuring the chemical composition of very sophisticated fine grained chemical analysis effectively for non uh, 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 um, but it's still got it's got a little rub a rubber funnel coming off it 
for someone to <laughs> sniff it. <laughs> so it's so like there's all this very expensive equipment that's doing its stuff, and it still requires a human a se a, a sense to smell it. Uh, well, I thought it was fabulous. Anyway. Yeah, and how do you code that? Then? That's probably there bringing the mic. <laughs> I'm picturing that too. It's yeah, yeah, it's <laughs> um, the gentleman who um, talked about the choice, um, a lot of the discussion, I'm a little bit, <clears throat> where do you think the line will be drawn in terms of the principle of parsimony about the choice of the individual versus what's good for the society and how that choice will impact across the board? And when you've got big data, it can go for, for the individual and for the society. How do you think that that's going to, to pan out? Um, well, that's why I'm here, because yeah. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, it, I think it, it comes at, down to, again, is, is, is uh, are we, from, my own, from a consumer's point of view, from my own individual point of view, I want control over that choice. Mm -hmm. I want mm -hmm. the right to make the choices for, for, for my life and my family and, and, and my kids. Does, does that mean that I'm acting in the best interest of society? Maybe not. Maybe I'm, I'm being selfish in the decisions that I'm making. Um, you know, obviously there are laws and there's a way to restrict me to behave within a, a particular society, but, you know, that's my decision. If you start talking about, well, you know, do we allow the government to start dictating what type of advertising or news that I see to try and control me? Well, then, you know, if we look at the current state of government, would you want the government controlling that? And is that best for society or is that, you know? So I think, you know, these are exactly the type of conversations that, yeah. that yeah. we need to have. And I, I don't think there's, a, there's an easy answer. Um, because, you know, if, if I was an, a nasty, evil person, then you might say, actually, I'd prefer it if the state had some say over what the choices you made and, 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 and what you saw and, and what you were exposed to. Um, but, you know, I, I hope that you would say, well, actually, that's, that's your choice. You need to do that. You need to, as, as humans, we need that. So. Just to add to that, um, the question of, you know, what, what is an organisation's ethical position on, you know, what narrow data are they feeding to you? You know, does someone like the News Corp you know, organisation, do they have a responsibility to actually show us a breadth of news and to give us, even though as consumers we're sort of poof, we don't want it and they just want the advertising dollar and that's what we want so that's what they're going to give us, mm -hmm. do they have a social responsibility to actually broaden us in some way? Mm. And if they do, should they be subsidised for having to do that? Because it's, yeah. if it's not profitable for them to do yeah. it, yeah. then should someone be subsidising to ensure that they actually cover a broad spectrum of news? And would we read it anyway? Because yeah. half of us, you know, yeah, there's Facebook, a whole lot of... Yeah. I mean, there's a whole lot of discussion, and this touches on too, around fake news, and particularly the US presidential mm -hmm. campaign, and ongoing activity since. So, you know, Zuckerberg came out and said, we're going to try and build an algorithm because you have to do an algorithm at that kind of scale of what they have to handle. But I'd say in the last month or so, he sort of changed his thinking a little bit and said, I need to think more about how we invent strong societies mm -hmm. that therefore, if the fake news does come down, you know, we're resilient enough to know, you know, what's not quite right. Mm -hmm. We're not going to interpret that the way that perhaps mm -hmm. it's been messaged to mm -hmm. us too. So it, it feels like it gets a bit bigger than, um, AI to resolve some of those kind of things. There's, there's an, another angle on that too with the Japanese, you know, the robotic carers with the ageing population and people are getting attached to these, you know, robots. Um, they're, they're, they are quite empathetic and there are scenarios where, you know, the robot sits to sort of mediate between the person and the carer because the carer is getting so frustrated with the the patient and the patient's feeling b belittled and, and so the robot's playing a role to a, as a mediator there to temper the behaviour. Now that's like complete reverse to what we've just been talking about. Um, they're playing a role in actually curbing and ensuring our empathy and our humanness remains. Um, but at what point do we then say, you know, legislatively or, or whatever that um, we need to remind people that yeah. these are machines. Um, you know, do we need to legislate that as they get better and better and more and more empathetic to remind people that they're not actually dealing with another human being and that the human-to-human -human contact then doesn't degrade because 
my sick grandmother has this ro yeah. robotic yeah. carer, so I don't I can abdicate responsibility. There was a beautiful sci-fi movie playing on that idea. And, West, Westworld. And, um, was I think it was one about a carer. I think was it called Tim or Ted? Watch Westworld. Look. That's yeah, and well, West Westworld's sort of dystopic, that, possibly. That really is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, but it's that it's that sense going going back to that observation that it's the partnership between the AI or the, or the machine and the human that 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 leads to really amazing outcomes. But what formula do you use? In the same way, there is no recipe for creativity. People like to think there is, but how does that come about? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if now on the other side we have to regulate and design and code. Where, where does flexibility and agility come in? I saw a hand jump up just when I said that. <laughs> um, I, I thought to just uh, latch on to some earlier comments about um, what do we as humans learn from the past. And uh, just running up to lunch, I feel I'm um, getting really concerned about how we're going to survive this artificial intelligence wave that's coming our way. But I've got three things to point to. And that's what got us from our feudal lifestyle to where we are now. Mm -hmm. And the one is education. Mm -hmm. The second is mobility, physical mobility, the ability to travel. And I think third, we need to, as, as a species, maintain our um, uh, freedom of thought and, and mm -hmm. protect ourselves against institutions or governments who want to force us thinking and acting in, in ways that serve yeah. their purpose. Yeah, so no. I think there's hope. Well, that's, that's a nice optimistic note maybe to end on on lunch. I'd add the fourth to that, which is resilience, which I think is, is something, you know, when I'm out in the rain, I don't rust. That's one thing that's about <laughs> resilience. But also, you know, in terms of surviving as a species, we've been hammered and, and hit with lots of things. And um, th that idea of learning from failure through that, that's, a, that's a, an aspect of that. But now as humans, we need food and drink, and we need a pause. Uh, please join me again in thanking this amazing panel. Thank you.